Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's special panel discussion. Should we say something? How to have discussions about racial equity. I know how busy you all are, that you're working on fundraising and managing the nonprofits you work for during a very strange time right now. So thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for a really important discussion about racial inequity. I know what we discuss may not be easy or comfortable, but by being here today, you show an open-mindedness and willingness to have this discussion, which I greatly appreciate, and I'm sure our panelists greatly appreciate as well. So, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Melena Cromie, and I am part of the team over here at QGive. Usually our nonprofit education manager, Abby Jarvis, um, manages the presenting of our webinars, but today she's gonna be helping me out managing questions as they come in. So thank you, Abby, for your help, I appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who are not QGIV clients, I just wanna say, um, kind of introduce QGIV. We are an online fundraising platform that focuses on helping nonprofits raise more money and part of how we do that is through hosting regular webinars like this one. Today's webinar, of course, is special though. We're going to be tackling a difficult topic that's focus isn't necessarily on how you can raise more money, but is on how you can effectively and compassionately have tough discussions within your organization and your community about racial inequity. Of course, for those of you that are not QGIV clients and would like to learn more about our company and our fundraising tools, please check the link above for more information. And now for some general housekeeping. We are recording this webinar. So tomorrow I will be sending out an email with a link to the recording and some other resources. So you guys all have this handy in case you wanna to return to it or share it with a colleague at your organization. And finally, we are going to be reserving the latter half of this discussion for a live Q&A. So please drop your comments in the chat box and our panelists will be sure to answer as many of your questions as possible before the end of our time together. So a brief intro. Today, I'm gonna to start by introducing our superstar panel, briefly discuss and remind us why we're here today and having this discussion. And then the panel will take turns answering some of the toughest questions they've received. And then we will open the floor for our live Q&A. So without further ado, I am going to begin introducing our panelists. First panelist I'm going to introduce is Terry Williams. Terry um, has an incredible professional background as a lobbyist, communications professional, and philanthropist. She's served on a number of nonprofit and educational boards. Her focus remains on paying it forward, encouraging and being with others who strive to create meaningful change through their work. Thank you, Terry, for being here with us today. Um, unfortunately, Terry does have another very important commitment today, so she is going to have to head out about halfway through our conversation, but we know everything that she contributes is going to be fantastic. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Next up, we have Kashana Palmer. Kashana is joining us after just hosting the brand new Uprooted Conference, a stay-at-home retreat for Black female and indigenous fundraisers and social sector professionals. We're incredibly excited to have Kashana here contributing her fundraising knowledge and experience. She's also a national speaker and has almost 20 years of fundraising experience under her belt. Next up, we have Julia Campbell. Julia is well known and respected in the nonprofit sphere for her social media knowledge and expertise. And heck, she even wrote the book on it, Storytelling in the Digital Age, A Guide for Nonprofits. Her goal is to show nonprofits how they can use social media and storytelling 
to build communities, showcase impact, and advance their causes. Now, last but certainly not least, I have Chirian Koshi. Chirian has over 20 years of nonprofit experience and is the founder of the Des Moines Fundraising Institute, an organization that teaches the art and science of effective fundraising. And did I mention that he is one of this country's most successful debate coaches? Pretty cool. We obviously have an incredible panel here today, and I want to thank you all for being here and taking time to share your insight and experience with us about handling these difficult conversations about racial inequity. So before we begin our discussion, I am going to briefly remind everybody why we're here and why we're having this talk today. In the beginning of June, protests over the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd erupted across the country and the world. These protests occurred in many of our own cities and towns, sparking civil rights movement for police reform and awareness of racism against Black citizens. The phrases, Black Lives Matter, I Can't Breathe, Justice for George Floyd or Breonna Taylor were everywhere. This movement and call for justice was something we not only saw erupt in our own towns and cities, it was something that we saw grow online every day. For those of us quarantining and glued to our computers or phones at home, it's all we saw for several days and even weeks. The national and global focus on these protests and the BLM movement compelled thousands of organizations and brands to issue public statements. Discussions about race were occurring exponentially online. 30 days after George Floyd's death, the rallying cry, Black Lives Matter, had been mentioned more than 80 million times across the web on sites like Facebook, Twitter, and different blogs. So it didn't just feel like these discussions were the only thing we saw. These discussions about race and BLM and protests truly were dominating the online world, something many of us have become increasingly plugged into during the pandemic. So why did so many companies offer BLM or inclusion statements during this movement? Well, for starters, it dominated the online landscape as we just discussed on the last slide. Posting content as usual during the week after the very first protests would have seemed insensitive and even been a sharp contrast compared to what everyone else was seeing and discussing online. Second, multiple, uh, multiple companies are changing in response to consumer expectations regarding making moral statements. These trends in consumer behavior are why you see more and more companies not shying away from taking an ethical stance publicly. It's becoming increasingly important, especially to Gen Z and millennials who want to give their time and resources to organizations that do not shy away from moral issues or events. So what does this mean for your nonprofits? What do you do in a time like this? Um, I saw a really good quote on a podcast I listened to earlier this week from diversity and inclusion specialist Era, Erica Karan. She said that now is the time to have a plan in place, not when racial inequity or another event dominates the news cycle again. So how do we address these issues, even when they fall outside of our cause area? Let's talk about it. This brings me to our first question for the panelists. And these are questions that we received in advance of this talk today. So, you know, keep submitting your questions in the chat and we will get to them a little later. Let's read this. We're a nonprofit that serves first responders, and thus our donors may not subscribe to the notion of BLM, white privilege, systemic racism, et cetera. 
how do you recommend we broach these topics internally or even publicly? Yeah, I'm happy to get started. Um, and I want to share a quote that I heard during John Lewis's incredible memorial today. Um, it's, it's always the timing of the universe that things happen at a specific time and reason. And I'm going to look at, um, at this quote on my phone so I don't get it wrong. But it says, answer the highest calling of your heart. And this was also part of his op-ed that was in the New York Times today that he wrote before he passed. We are part of this social sector. You know, we are nonprofit leaders because we have done that, right? Then the second part says, continue to build unions between the movements. And that's the answer to this question. Um, and I love that so much. I'm a person, I believe leaders turn moments into movements. I say it at least 10 times a day. And so you might be a leader in the space with first responders. You know, they are answering important phone calls, you know, police, fire departments, um, people that, you know, even help with mental health right now are being considered first responders. And so these things are not divorced, they are married. Um, a lot of these things are already built within systemic issues that are tied to race. You know, so I was a, a lobbyist for a very large nonprofit and we worked on two things while I was there. One was getting 911 to everyone. There's still some places in the country that do not have 911. Um, most of them are rural. Most of them are places where black people live. That is the why, you know, and, and so, so also goes, you know, a lot of fire departments are, are not near black neighborhoods um, in my hometown. And so you can find that union and that intersection um, in a place where you can encourage your board to, to end systemic racism, to end systemic injustices, injustice even within your mission. And you know, you don't have to think about mission drift. You do have to think about intent. And to even take it a step further, you have to act on that intent. And we all know that's where we fall short a lot. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sure all of you have plenty to say on this. Terry, I love that. What a powerful quote, right? You know, I think that it just causes you to just sort of stop for a second. And one of the things that I love that you always say that leaders turn moments into movements, that thing just sat in my spirit when I met you a couple of years ago. I was like, yeah. <laughs> And what's so true about that is that sometimes I think that we allow our our fight or flight mechanism to pull us into a place where we operate from this level of fear and fear causes you to respond in all types of like really wacky ways. One of them is to like every rational thought that you have, things that you know to be true, go to the wayside and then you start to like recount things that you learned when you were eight and, or, and if you were like me, you grow up, some things that your parents would say, you'd be like, no, nah, I know that's not correct. But it, you glom onto it in a period of fear. And so for organizations that don't see themselves um, as having a mission that specifically calls out issues that really affect black and brown people and marginalized communities, particularly in this country, each of your missions at its root is designed to eradicate a problem. And so a unifying thread, if I pulled it for each of us is, these are problems that are rocking the very neighborhoods of the families, of the pets, of the environments, I can just keep going, of the mm -hmm. arts, of every aspect of the things you know and love and can wrap like a warm blanket, when you pull that thread, it all just starts to unravel. And so we have a responsibility to not pretend that this is the time we're going to put blinders on and go, oh, that doesn't affect me. Oh, no. This is actually the time that we've got to get focused and recognize that there are more things in our bucket that we are responsible for than things outside that we can elect to ignore. So, you know, that's, that's sort of my feeling on this one that we have got to be, we've got to be brave. I don't like to create safe spaces, y'all. I like to create brave spaces. Mm. Because every space is not safe, even when you're among your own folks. And so you've got to step forward bravely and to be able to step into our sector to take on work that feels a little daunting. You got to be brave. And that's that ounce of right beyond that fear, that courage, that's that next step. That's the bravery. Yep. 
Can I jump in? I, in my work in nonprofits, they love silos, right? They love silos inside the organization. Like mm -hmm. that's not my job. I don't do marketing. I don't do fundraising. I don't do programs. I don't do whatever, you know, you name it. And they really like silos outside of their organization. Like we're in our little lane. We do arts or we're a community theater or we are a food bank or we're an animal shelter. But what I would love for more nonprofits to embrace is just exact this quote, continue to build unions of, among movements. I don't, what I would love to see as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the Black Lives Matter protests, George Floyd protests, the unrest is, I would love to see unions develop and collaborations and talking to each other, sharing resources. And we know Vule of Nonprofit AF talks a lot about that and how to share our, you know, share our knowledge and, and just share what we're doing. But we're all in this together. You can't just say, I'm a homeless shelter and that's it. That's all I do. Because there's so much systemically that happens before people become homeless that keep them homeless. So I think um, I, I would love to see organizations talking more amongst themselves, creating more collaborations, more brave spaces, and creating these, like building unions among movements. That's what I'd love to see. Breaking down those silos. Well, let me, oh, do you want to say something, Tyrion? No, I'm good. I was just going to say, <laughs> they covered it. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm taking notes. You guys are great. Let's get through our second one here. Um, I've been having difficult conversations with my executives about taking an open stand on the BLM movement, even though we serve over 80% people of color. Our leadership and board are all white, as am I. How do you suggest I speak with them when their primary concern is losing funding? So I'm happy to jump in on this one. Um, and I think that Julia covered a bit of this in what she said uh, just now. And that is that there is a, there's an impetus among nonprofits to really focus on their silos and say, you know, we're an organization that doesn't really, isn't somehow affected by this. The thing that I would just reinforce to this person is that philanthropy at its core is about the love of humans. And that's what the Greek word means. And it's not just the people who are your beneficiaries, it's everybody in the community. And so when when Julia says something like, we're all in this together, part of your job as a fundraiser is to relay the concerns of your beneficiary out to people who haven't really who don't know or aren't aware and to open those eyes and to be able to say there are needs in this community that that you might not be aware of. Um, and so there's a lot in this question that I, I, I don't know if we have time to unpack and I, I want to give um, the other panelists an opportunity to unpack stuff as well. But the, one of the things that I'll note um, is that when, when you say that your leadership and your board are all white, that speaks to part of the issue uh, and something that needs to start to change um, in order to be more representative of your community, especially when you're serving 80% people of color. Um, that's not to say that you can't be a change agent and a, an advocate currently, but it's something that I would prioritize as that organization. Um, and then being able to, as a, a, as a white person that's asking this question, I just want to applaud you for asking that question, but really when when you're positing the approach of should we take a stand versus losing funding, you may want to reconsider how those things are, are, are in your mind opposed to one another mm -hmm. and really identify ways in which those two things can come together and be on the same side. Uh, and that's where we need to be as, uh, as fundraisers, as, as nonprofits is to say, you know, folks, um, we need to embrace the the opportunities to share this story of what's happening to our own beneficiaries in, in the case of, of this organization um, and how funding for whatever this organization does is super important. And, and uh, ideally, if you're going to lose funding as a result of making a stand, uh, there's really a 
a, a larger disconnect that y'all need to, to address. Um, I'll just end my comments by saying, and I probably should have started here because I like to start these conversations with that. I want to acknowledge my own privilege in in mm -hmm. answering the question and just being here, first of all, as a, as a cis male, um, uh, but also while I'm a person of color, I do uh, appreciate that I fall under the more mo model minority myth. Um, that's not to say that systemic racism and other uh, issues like immigration don't affect me and my family, but uh, I do want to acknowledge that and just to say that even if you are a person of color, there's so much that uh, we can learn from one another. So uh, just to answer this question, even though you're white, uh, as, a, as the asker of this question, um, there, there are plenty of ways in which we all need to continue to open ourselves up to understanding our own privilege and how that impacts some of these discussions. Yeah, now I wanna give Terry a chance to address this since she's gotta hop off here in about five or so minutes. So Terry, do you have any thoughts on this? You were so incredibly mindful and thoughtful. Oh my gosh, who who does that? Yeah. But um, oh my gosh. But you know, like there's a bigger threat. <laughs> and the threat is not what the board is focused on, right? The the board is worried about losing money, but if they don't change the seats at the table, they're gonna lose money just by the way they look like, right? Foundations expect more from nonprofits today. They expect not only for your board to, to give, um, but they expect your board to be ref a reflection of the community, not the community that you serve, but your, your community. So I, I don't think there's a single city or county in the US that is 100% white. Um, and, and so I, I definitely think you got to change what that looks like. But you know, um, I've been talking to a lot of people and I think one tool that we don't often use, we might um, have our boards focused a whole lot on raising money, but we don't ever ask our boards to do a self-assessment and an assessment of, our, of their work. So this might be an opportunity for you to teach the board a little bit about your mission as well and, and give them some people to talk to in the community where they could learn more about the work that you do, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they might start to hear from others in the community that they need to change the makeup of that board um, and that might help them move a little quicker. But yeah, I too wanna say snaps and um, just thank you for, for pushing that needle forward. It is a difficult conversation, but if we truly want to be leaders that are turning this moment into a movement, we each have to pick up a piece of the work. No movement ever moved alone, and this indeed won't also move alone. You'll you'll want to have some help from your colleagues, um, you know, a champion within that leadership team of your executive team members, and maybe even find someone that is white on the board to be an ally to have your back as you, you move that conversation along. Awesome. I think one of the things that's uh, to lift up here is that uh, white folks aren't the only ones having these struggles and stress. <laughs> y'all come y'all to the camera so you can see you know what I said? <laughs> have y'all noticed I'm black today? I just want to remind you, sometimes y'all forget, okay? <laughs> we aren't the only ones. Everybody is struggling. Imagine spending your entire career of being this, look at this, this is good skin and lighting, y'all, and good teeth, and having to hold <laughs> your tongue, right? Terry, you have better teeth than me, though, I have to say. But having uh -huh. your whole career having to hold your tongue in rooms and in conversations and modulate every word, every conversation is now the right time that every chip you put on the table is the last poker chip you put on the table. And so my friend who asked this question, put all your chips on the table. Cause I guarantee you, if you go to the register, there'll be more chips waiting for you. Yeah. And that is the boldness that we have to take as it relates to, and I say this all the time, it's not about funding. It's about being able to help bring resources to bear for your organization. And you gotta be bold and bad with it. And so what I hear when I'm reading into this question, and forgive me if this is not quite right, y'all already operating from a place of fear. And the donor, one, two, five, has a heck of a lot more power. It's supposed to be a partnership. It's supposed to be a co-conspirator, a co-actor, mm -hmm. co not a hostage holder. And that's what it sounds like you all have in your organization. And so if you feel like you're being held in a bank rob rob you know, robbery right now with funding, y'all, we have a different set of work to do. 
So, you know, that's, I just want to add my three cents on that one. Amen. I well, was, that was some more like five cents. <laughs> I know. Yes, it. dollars. Yes, <laughs> dollars. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, Julia, I know that you were about to say something on that one. No, no, I think it covered it. I, I, and can I throw in one last thing? I, I forgot about this, but there's two elements here. The leadership and the board are all white. And there's a difference between changing the board that Terry mentioned that's really important. But changing leadership is also employment's a different factor. I don't we don't have time to do all that right now. But if your employment is all white, you also have some problems. So <laughs> yeah. you you need to figure that out. And that's that's not good. Um so just think through that piece, especially as well as you kind of navigate this issue. I'm yeah. gonna bounce before y'all get into the next question, but I wanna give everyone my email address. Maybe you can do that when you send the link. I am yeah. here, I real, I do reply to all email, might take a hot minute, but um, I believe in this work. I believe in what each of these people are doing. And I don't know if I've been part of a more thoughtful experience um, in curating the questions and the panel. And so I'm so appreciative to be a part of this community. And thank you for the work that y'all do because you're touching hearts and minds every day. So thanks, Terry. Thanks, thanks Terry. Okay. Let's see here. I'm never the loudest person in the room. In fact, far from it but this seems too important to skim over. So my voice got louder this week. How do we push leadership to continue treading water without saying something? So this this is my note, right? To start this one. Sure. Um, well, I'm always the loudest person in the room. So I, I, but I can relate to not wanting to say the wrong thing, but I took a couple of notes because this is a question that I've actually received before. And I just want to go back to the Brene Brown quote that I say all day, every day, because I have been in these rooms with white people and also actually cheering what you said. I do want to acknowledge, of course, my privilege as a white cis woman having these conversations but to not have the conversations because they make you feel uncomfortable is the definition of privilege. And that's Brene Brown. And you just say it every day, all day to everyone. When people come to me and they say, or, you know, I'm, I'm at these tables, I'm in these conversations, I'm at, you know, family members and friends, they say, well, just enough with all of this stuff. And can't we get back to normal? And it's too political. And I don't want to talk about politics. And the way I frame it is, yeah, to not have these conversations because they make you feel uncomfortable, it makes them more essential. So difficult conversations are essential conversations. And, you know, keep in mind what might happen if you don't have the conversation and just use that as your motivation. And I think my top tip for start getting started is determine the purpose. You know, uh, what do you hope to accomplish by having this conversation? And then allow the other person to ask questions, right? And make sure to frame all the entire conversation around the lens of the bigger picture. So you're not you know, it's just not that you're frustrated, you don't have, you know, your personal feelings, it's more about how can we make this um, about the organization, the mission, the cause, you know, the bigger picture, but don't short change yourself and don't think twice and don't ever feel like what you're feeling is not acceptable. You know, don't ever feel like what you're feeling and, and how you've been made to feel um, is not acceptable. So I've had a lot of difficult conversations with relatives, as I'm sure we have all had. And oftentimes I come from a place of emotion and I'm usually not apologetic about it because I'm loud and I'm emotional and I feel the way I feel about things. But if you really want to change someone's hearts and hearts and minds, or if you want to have, if you want to broach this topic in a professional way, come from a place of asking questions and 
also really understand that sometimes people have good intent. They just don't know what to say, or maybe they don't have the right words to say. That's very different from a person that does not have good intent and has no intention of changing how they feel, right? But if a person is coming to you and trying to have a conversation or you're trying to have a conversation with someone else and they might just be stumbling over the words or they might not know the proper terms or they might feel like they're going to look stupid and fall on their face, then I think our responsibility is to come from a place of empathy and and try and compassion and, and trying to understand and, and trying to make those connections. Of course, of course, if it's like, you know, crazy racist Uncle Dave, like forget it, delete block, like don't talk to him, like that's fine. I'm all I'm all for that. But if it's someone that's genuinely wanting to have a conversation to figure out how to make things better and how to move things forward and how to learn more and better themselves, then just try to come to them with that place from compassion and empathy. So I think that would be my biggest piece of advice. Okay. One of the things that, that jumped out to me is, you know, I'm normally not the loudest person in the room. I'm very loud, you know, <laughs> um, and unapologetically so, like Julia said. And so one of the things that I will say is if you are normally the person that doesn't really say much, you know, you, you have an eye. You know, you sit back in your chair, but now we're at home. So now people can see all your business and your body language. Most of human communication is nonverbal. I want you to know. So you can say a whole lot and not open your mouth. But when you do, now is the time for you to be really intentional by, by saying things like, um, excuse me, John. The, <clears throat> enough. Yeah. So one good place. Some, you know, somebody's mama somewhere just got excited. You know, one good place. Enough already is more. I right? just look at your face. You did it again is enough to have somebody dead in their tracks and say, hey, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm really uncomfortable. And, you know, folks will say different things. Calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. That's, a, that's the thing that made me take off the other earring I have. You want me to calm down? Can you smile. <laughs> just calm down. Right. Oh, just relax. I don't want to talk about so and so. You don't have to talk about it. But here's the thing. Actions are happening anyway. And so I think what is becoming really clear whether you're talking about our corporate counterparts or you're talking about us in the social sector, is that with leadership becomes responsibility, with responsibility comes accountability. And the folks that are feeling the flex the most are my middle managers who don't feel like they have real agency, but the more agency you have, the more accountability you have. And so again, it is really your charge to be able to use some of your social capital to name and to speak on behalf of things that are not right when people who are affected by those things are in the room and especially when they're not. And so I think that what we're seeing now is folks who have been just sort of like zombie walking, doing just being happy in the world, just going out to the, you know, to the, to the, to the fair on the weekends now are confronted with themselves and their families they don't like, with the job that now they can't escape because we're about to go into a depression and oh hell, people are dying in the street. And I gotta do something about it. I can't ignore it now. There's no place to escape to. There's no mall. You know, I can't go to the lake house. Right? And so we are all coming into the storm that the distractions that used to keep us safe, yeah. if you will, were mirages. And now we are dealing with reality. And so all of us are dealing with some version of this question. Mine, y'all, is I don't have patience for y'all in the ways I used to. Like, I I will real upset. No, we're not meeting. Mm -mm. But before, I might have put a long, flowery way of getting to the end. And that is my choice now until I build up my reserve again. But think of what's happening now to many, many of us and many people of color. And I want to remind y'all again for the second time today that I am Black. Okay. That it's like a Super Mario Brothers game. For those of y'all, I'm, I'm dating myself. And you're playing your game or Zelda. Let's get into it, y'all. And you know when you're getting those blows and you remember when the light, when you be blinking because you're losing the life? Imagine feeling like you're losing that all the time. You're just on low. And so that is what lots of folks are experiencing. And so this question inherently says that you actually have more energy because you've been quiet to now speak up. So use it. Love it. Well, I think I'm going to ask one more question before we dive into Q&A because we're getting a lot of good ones. Um, okay. Let's do this next one here. Okay, I want to add one thing to what Kashana yeah. said. 
I want to take the example of um, my sister-in-law and we are a very loud family my, on my side and talking and talking over each other and she observes and she just kind of observes and then she always has the best thing to say mm -hmm. at the end of the night or in the middle of the evening or she'll text me later and say something. So it's not that you have to be loud to have a voice. It's just mm -hmm. that you have to use your voice in some way and it's your responsibility to use your voice and however, maybe it's an email, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's saying something publicly, calling somebody out, but your responsibility right now is to use your voice. Yeah. So next one, before we try and do the live Q&A, um, this kind of touches on some of the things we've been talking about earlier with boards, with um, our organizational makeup. How can we begin to diversify our organization and its leadership? Yeah, I think I'll take that one. I think it is really, really simple. Mm -hmm. It is a choice. Like, mm -hmm. I want to remind y'all that your life is your choice. Mm -hmm. And so we make intentional decisions about who we hire and why, about mm -hmm. who we promote and why, about who gets the plum stretch project, the new donor, who gets to fail and try again and why. And so if we're really committed to making sure that we actually want to grow and thrive as organizations, the proof is in the data. Okay, McKinsey's put it out, Harvard Business Review and School has put out case after case. When teams are more diverse, racially, gender, and every other number, don't come to me with, with diversity of thought, y'all. We're going to have a whole different conversation. That's last on the list, very last. Mm -hmm. But when teams are more diverse, innovation, creativity, the magic just happens. So if you want your organization to close that first seven figure gift you haven't been able to reach for, Diversify your leadership. Mm -hmm. If you want to be able to attract the kind of talent to your organization that's hungry and thirsty and they're superstars and they bring with them that thirst and that desire to learn and grow, you've got to be able to diversify your leadership. And so the how for me is in thinking about succession planning and thinking about how your talent mapping aligns to your strategic planning or your organizational planning and growth and looking at when you have position turnovers, who do you rehire? If a person of color leads your organization, is there an intention to replace that talent with similar talent? Can you get beyond your statement? What are you putting in place to incent folks to stay? Are your financial practices preferencing people who have financial privilege? So y'all see where we can start? You're like, well, Kashana, I'm not opening any new jobs anytime soon. You can start with your financial practices if you want to talk about diversifying your organization and leadership. We can start there. And so there are ways in which each of you along your journey can start to implement small steps, medium steps, larger steps, depending on how bold you want to be in this time, so that you can start to see change and attract people who'll say, I'll be the first or the number three, or you know, I'll come on and try because they know that you all want to grow and learn together. So it's, it's all about choice and intention to me. I just wanna reinforce that. So it's, it is certainly about the first choice and then it is every choice after that. So uh, one of the things that we did right away with our board was identify folks. And, and I wanna kind of counterbalance that to say, you can make the choice like our question before to make a statement about black lives matter but that rings inauthentic and untrue if your practices uh 30 days from now or three years from now do not evidence the fact that black yeah. lives matter so nobody cares about your statement if that's all it is and that's true when it comes down to who's replacing somebody on the board and if you view it as token if you say we need a black woman on the board and now we're done and then we just need to replace one black woman with another black woman, that's stupid. The idea mm -hmm. is how do you consistently reinforce diversity on your board and increase that diversity over time as well as on your staff, right? So it's not just, oh, we have hired some, some people of color um, 
it, it is really how are, how do all of those practices consistently reinforce that one example of that just to to give some practicality to to what i'm saying is um we just adopted a an unlimited pto model um primarily because PTO has always been, as Kishana mentioned, a financial practice that adversely affects um, certain, you know, certain types of people, um, mm -hmm. given their, their care requirements for family members or anything like that. If you just care about the work being done, it doesn't matter if those people are at home, uh, it doesn't, you know, or how much PTO they take. So I would just encourage you to think through um, what does that look like? Healthcare um, premiums, all those types of things are examples of what Kishana is saying. Yeah, and to add, I mean, there are certain practices that have been proven to increase the diversity in hiring. Number one is putting your salary requirements. I think this is just like a standard thing that people need to be doing now. Um, putting your salary range or your salary requirements into your job descriptions. Um, but secondly, not requiring these completely insane and inane um job requirements for a starting position and i think it's especially true right now where people are you know they're they're not able to afford a college education or they're not even i mean people are just you know everything is kind of going to hell in a handbasket right now but i think there are things that you can do that will you know you can be intentional and you can learn and figure it out my other thing is when people come to me and they say well, Julia, you know, there's just no black people that apply for our board positions. That's just lazy. You're lazy and Tell you got to do better. Tell it. I mean, honestly, or people come to me and speaking at a conference. Well, there's no people of color speaking at the conference. We couldn't find any speakers. Lazy. Okay. Don't be lazy. Go on LinkedIn. Talk to me. Don't just talk to Kashana because I know. Kashana. I can't even imagine investment. your inbox right like, now. Back pocket. I just want y'all to know at every <laughs> investment point. So don't write to her and say, hey, do you know any other black folks that could talk at our conference? I guarantee you've gotten 900 emails like that. Oh my um, gosh. Maybe really you want people to do that, but I think people need to be doing their own work and their own research and their own networking and just kind of figuring it out. So I think it's also on people that have privilege to elevate other voices that people might not have heard and to also when you get approached for an opportunity to say hey there's some other awesome people that I know that you might not have heard of only because we don't we're not on the same stage as you know we're not um in the same rooms and just because it seems like it's this the same you know 10 people all the time so yeah don't be lazy that's my drop like mic that. end yeah, of the moment don't be lazy, don't be lazy. I love that. And I think that I just love the tangible nature of just like the examples. I think the PTO is awesome. Yeah. And I think that the salary is awesome. So if you post with the Rooted Collaborative on our site right now, if you're not committed to uh, the salary range, to being clear about core competencies, to being clear about what success looks like and how you've been able to help folks of color in your organization thrive, we don't want your money. Like, it's fine. You know, we don't want it to be in your search just so you can say, well, we try. You know, like that is, we don't want them. So I love that. Don't be lazy, Julia. I'm just going to say, my friend Julia said, don't be lazy. That's all. That's what I will write back. Amen. Amen. That's it. Okay, guys, it's getting real in the questions. Woo! I, I, <laughs> I got can't, a hot I, I there, there are some things here that are speaking to me. Okay, let's hear it. Have my unicorn water. Right. I'm like, let me get my, look, I have my, I drink my, my gallon of water, y'all, every day. Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> Okay. As long as um, it's not the guy trolling to uh, Kish and I on Twitter right now. Oh my Ew. God. Can I tell you it's the funny thing ever? I was like, should I engage him or should I just like send him funny memes? Right now? I got you, girl. I got you. No, you and Ashwa were well, knocking on. I was like, I have way smarter friends. I don't need to do any noise. <laughs> no. Like, no. Right here. I just knew you were doing a conference and you did not Thank need you. that noise at that oh, time. Oh, I tag you me. You're doing something right when you get in trolled. I've always said that to myself. That's like true. that's true. What you are. are. Someone's paying attention. Okay, okay guys. Jealous. Go ahead. What are the questions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the this is the one that got me. I will be working on a large capital campaign with my church in the fall. There are many strong opinions on Black Lives Matter and the riots. Many church members are lumping the negative things they see on TV 
instead of reviewing the needs and liberties not being offered to people of color. I'm yeah. struggling with putting my personal feelings aside and incorporating members into the process who I don't agree with. How do I overcome my personal feelings to move on to the bigger picture? I'm going to tell you what, I, uh, as a believer, that's going to test your spirit in ways that you don't even, you're not even ready for. So I need you to get in your prayer room and get your prayer cloth because you are going to need all of it because there's no such thing anymore as leaving yourself outside. We're not having out of body experience. It's not poltergeist. And so the reality is I'm going to need you to find a scripture, get right in your Ephesians, and you mm. need to be able to come with it when you are having conversations, particularly because giving as it relates to stewardship in faith-based communities is very much tied, if you were talking about a Christian campaign, to what Jesus would do. And so really getting clear with your word, that could be attached to some of the tenets that you were using in your campaign, particularly when you are going to talk to folks. I know that's not popular. It's not campaign theory. But you've got to get clear. Part of it is building relationships and being able to meet people where they are and knowing when you are not the person that needs to be in the room for that conversation and yeah. being able to tap somebody else in. If you are not in a position to say no thank you to that gift, but you don't have to subject yourself to that in uh, because you need to be able to raise funds, that's abuse. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Um, that's what I say. Take care of yourself and know when you can tap out. I would just echo what Kashana said. So they said church and member. So this is this is something that I do. And as a believer, I'll say three things. One is we're going through a study of Acts right now, and uh, the 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 expansion of the gospel goes first to the oppressed. It goes to an Ethiopian eunuch first, meaning that before it goes anywhere else, it goes to a person of color and someone who was oppressed by their culture. So if you want more resources, you contact me. I got I got all that. And we can, yes. we can read Ephesians together. The, the other thing that you, the second thing that you need to understand if you are a Christian believer is that the concept of privilege has to be core to your faith. Unearned mm. privilege is the Christian faith. It is something that you do not get by merit. So there is no way that you can be in a church and have membership unless you fully embrace the idea that you are forgiven, not by your own doing. Uh, and finally, I would say that as you're talking to people who disagree, they are doing what Kashana said uh, uh, earlier uh, separately, which is it's a death of a thousand razor blades. It is they're cutting these little things out to say, well, I don't like violence. I don't like riots. At, mm -hmm. at its core, red herring. It's a red herring. Yes, it's a, it's all about red herring. It's all about exceptions. Diversion. There are, there are core truths, big truths that you need to be focused on. That that of uh, where love in and compassion uh, exist, and so those are the things that y'all need to focus on as you go through that campaign. I'm going to Cherian's church. I'm going to go. You're welcome <laughs> anytime. Well, uh, can I just add really quick? I just, I, I want to be honest. I have these difficult conversations all the time with very specific family members that I will not call out who say, well, look at the protests. It's just a bunch of criminals. It's Antifa. It's this, it's Fox news. It's Republican, whatever it is. I'm not trying to get political, but it is a, a literal litany of talking points that people have read to divert from what's really happening and to kind of, you know, make this weird red herring and, and um, say like, look over here, like the Wizard of Oz kind of thing. And it's really distressing. And I, I think in a professional situation, it would probably be even more distressing for me, but it's not your job to get in point by point by point by point with them. Like why this is yeah. not actually true or why this is a lie. It's your job to more, to convey the mission, I think, or to try to get them to understand like what Cheering was saying, like the empathy and the love and like, let's not get into the weeds into exactly like, what is you know true and what's not true because you could go all day every day with that but and also just fe really feel free to just say look this is not true like this is this is or this is not what we believe this is not how we're approaching this 
And this is what we believe as a community, as a church. And um, we're just going to move forward from here, like just kind of cut off those discussions. Because what I found is, you know, unless you're really willing to to put on the boxing gloves and in, in my family, I totally am. But in a professional situation, I don't know if I'd be really willing to to dispute every single claim. Because yeah, this is a good that. segue, Julia. Um, more real. sometimes people say completely insane things that they saw on the news. And you know, what is your job as a fundraiser? And I think that's what we're talking about. Um, what is our job as a development professional if someone says to you, and this is something that has actually been said to me by a family member, Hillary Clinton is a devil worshiper that eats babies. Like that could be said to you oh, in a joy. conversation or something else look crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do you like? What is our responsibility to just say? I think we just say, okay, I'm going to let my boss talk to you, or, you know, that I don't know. I think these are just like, these are things that come up in conversation, and nothing is off the rails anymore. Nothing is out of I've bounds got, anymore. I've got one more. Um, actually, I have a ton more. Uh, lightning round. <laughs> How can I? Okay, I'll, I'll stop talking within my organization without getting fired. Whenever I speak up, my supervisor feels attacked, but I'm not personally attacking her or discrediting the work that she has done in the past. Okay, so there's a power dynamic that's happening there, right? Um, I don't know some of the other dynamics that are happening in that question. And so one of the things that I have tried to, that I do, and I have to coach folks to do is to be able to name a feeling and name a fact. And so what I'd like to say is, my experience in this situation has been this. I've observed that this has occurred. I keep walking away from this exchange feeling like, and that might not be a fact, but this is the experience it keeps leaving me with. What were you trying to say when you said X? What did you mean when you did Y? And I find that even in talking to a supervisor, and I will tell y'all, I'm part of my privilege. I've been in C-suite for my whole career. So my supervisor is my CEO or the board. And so part of the challenge in that dance, that that's another, you know, uh, power dynamic is to say, look, I, I hope this doesn't put you on edge. And if it does, let me just apologize for doing that in advance. But I would be remiss if I did not say, and then the thing you need to say. And what I'd like for you to do is sit with it. And then if we can just come back to this conversation after you've had some time to, to, to really reflect on it, it would really, really go a long way because what I really want is whatever the result is, right? And so to name where you want the thing to go so that you don't allow that person's um, performative fragility to carry the conversation. And also if they really, if the feelings really are hard, they have to see people about that. And so you have to decide how much you want to invest in the feelings conversation. And if it happens over and over again, to name it. I notice whenever I tell you something that is happening that I really want us to be able to move through or solve together, that what it ends up being is me comforting you around how you felt about what I said. That's really uncomfortable for me because that's not a mm -hmm. position I really want to be in. I really see you as a thought partner and want to be able to solve together. And that doesn't happen. How can we change that? Um, and I think that's one of the ways I, a couple of different ways that I would um, try to approach that. What do y'all think? The white tears part, that's huge. Um, I would I would just add judgment over persistence. So at a certain point, if you do what Kashana said and it doesn't work and you're in a PWI, a predominantly white institution that isn't responsive, that you shouldn't keep running into a brick wall. Find another yeah. place. Find another place. Exactly. Yeah. I wouldn't add anything. Um, I would love to hear you speak to what accountability accountability looks like at a nonprofit who needs to recognize where they've fallen short and share their plans for change. What would you recommend when it comes to shape shaping a statement or a plan like that? Almost a two parter. So maybe let's talk about accountability first. Um accountability for what though? Just accountability for their for shortcomings. Accountability, I think, for following through with diversity and inclusion. So let's say you put out a statement. How are we actually going to make sure that we follow through on this? I mean, you can't really be accountable unless it's tied to your money. Right. We do stuff because we get foundations to invest in our organizations. Mm -hmm. If they were just cutting checks all willy nilly, some folks would be doing what they have designed to do. Others would be in the news. 
-hmm. That is human nature. And so the reality is if you're not tying the efforts that you are positing around your equity work to salaries, so if your organization has bonuses or other types of pay structures, mm -hmm. performance and evaluations for your executive leadership and your top leadership, if it is not uh, ingrained and if it's not threaded into people's performance, initially it's not going to be a thing. If not, if it's not a, if not if it's a, uh, not a foundational value of your organization, or if it's not an actual like the 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 leadership, the chief executive and his or her uh, C suite and the board back in their play comes in and really says, we're gonna get behind this work, what do we need to do to make it happen and put money behind it. So an effort without a check, uh, that's a very nice slogan. I think making, yeah, and making a public statement and being more transparent. So saying, not just saying we support Black Lives Matter, but really discussing what exactly are you going to do? I know Bloomerang did that. I know there's like a few, um, like Ben and Jerry's did that very publicly mm -hmm. and they've always done that for years. But there's a very, there's a lot of brands that have come out and done very public statements that are not, that to me don't seem just like, oh, um, we're kind of just making a flowery statement. Here yeah. are the five things that we're committed to doing. And then we're going to reevaluate every few months and we're going to be held accountable. So, you know, if it's not something that you can quantify, then I don't think you can be held accountable for it. So rather than just saying we value our employees, we value diversity, what the heck does that mean? Actually put some numbers behind it or percentages, or like Ashana said, some money or like put something where I can quantify it and then measure you against that later. The only thing that I would add is you, there needs to be an understanding at the beginning of the conversation that no organization anywhere is perfect, that there mm -hmm. is that we are always in a constant state of improvement. So to be open to the to criticism is the critical element of beginning that conversation. Yeah. If you think if your leadership thinks the organization is good the way it is, you got way bigger problems because then there there is no movement whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Oh. But listen, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to keep saying it. Okay. Yeah. Quote me. Take a picture of it. If the money isn't on it, mm -hmm. okay, yep. then I don't want it. Y'all got yep. that? If the mm -hmm. money is not on it. I don't want it. Yes. Because for me, I could stay home in my house and not invite y'all over to my cookout. Y'all here? And so mm -hmm. if you're going to do something, put your back into it. And that's that's what I, and how you, how you interpret that. Some of us who are much more eloquent in the ways in which we describe the things we'd like to do. Y'all see how I can get to you? Make sure that you understand at the end of the day, take it home and do something about it. Yes. Okay. Next one. Um, let's see. We're in the middle of centering Central Americans in our work. And this includes bringing in Central Americans to the org to do fundraising. How can we best support our fundraisers of color? Shana, you just did an entire retreat about that. I did. I mean, the conditions have to be there or you have to create them. First, you have to ask folks, what do they actually want? And then you have to go out and get it. Most people, and this is universally true, want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want community. And so if you are bringing in folks from a different part of the world into your organization to be a resource for your organization, what are the things that you have put in place so that they are seen, heard, and can build community? So that they actually can replicate some of the things that allow them to feel like they are home in their work environment such that they can be their best selves. The thing that I, I want y'all to dispel the myth of is the leadership, the organization, the management. You know that we're people, right? Mm -hmm. Put a name on it. And so if you want Kashana, to be comfortable so that I can do the darn thing and I can close gifts and I can bring in transformational gifts and catalytic investments into the organization, ask me what is going to be true for me to be comfortable. It could be food, it could be music, it could be entertainment, it could be something even sim simpler in environment, it could be conversation, it can be a facilitator or a group coach. Yeah. Ask. 
and then okay. do it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, I want to, I just want to talk about Kashana. When I saw you speak one time, you were talking about the love languages. Yes. Of your different team members. Yes. And that really struck me. And I've always thought about that and always implemented that with people I've worked with. Can you Is just it good? talk about that? I love that. I know it's more than we can talk about in five minutes, but yeah, I, I think do have it, to it, say, it speaks to exactly what you were just saying. We are at time. So right. we well, we learn more. Right? We can learn more. But everyone has a different love language that speaks to them, that yeah. motivates them. Do you guys have five minutes to address one more question or two? Sure. Okay. Just want to say I'm a person of color. Um, how can I help my organization retain and hire a more diverse workforce when I myself am a woman of color who is in a low level role without a secure full time position? Mm. That's a hard one. Sharon, you got that one? You want to have thoughts, but go ahead. You know, I will talk all day. <laughs> I, I, I'm excited to hear what you're going to say, too. Um, I would say it, it is a hard one because of where you are in this space. So I would st start by finding a champion uh, that can come alongside and say, this is a project that is is worthwhile. So uh, start to build a coalition inside the organization of people who believe in the value of diversity, as Kashana mentioned, all the studies point to that, and then look for a small win. Identify uh, a job description that will actively recruit a person of color. Don't try and jump at, uh, you know, we want to be at 30%. If you're the only person of color, we want to be at 30%. You're going to be frustrated real fast. Uh, but if you can, if you can start small and then celebrate those wins, that's at least what I've seen in predominantly white institutions start to move the needle. Uh, it's not ideal. I get that, but it's a, uh, it's a starting point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't have a thought, but I have more of a question leading, leading on this. What do you say to people that say, well, I don't see color when I hire. I don't see color. I just want you to know that somebody who I know <laughs> grabbed me in my face and told me that and I was going to cut her in the throat. I just want you to know I would have been in prison. Oh, I, I hear that a lot. I was when on my way. Push people. I was on my way. What do you right say? This doesn't rub off. What, <laughs> what do we say today? Y'all know I'm black, right? I just want to say it for the third time today, just in case anybody noticed. No, just in case you forgot. Okay. And so when people say I don't see color, Oftentimes I just stare blankly. Like, you know, when little kids just stare blankly at you because they just yeah. know you just said something real dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. I don't see color when I hire. I don't see color in my organization. Therein lies the problem. Yeah, right. Th therein lies your problem. I've said to family members, um, my sister said that to me, and I said, there are certain experiences that other people have you know, that we don't. And it's important to be able to recognize those. I think it's and only white people that say it, maybe. It's, only white, it's really, because if you don't see color, I just want you to know that that makes me invisible. And that means that I should be able to eat all the snacks in your house yes. and you wouldn't know that I was there. That's right. So you know, I'm coming in. Also, every resume that I will ever put out in my life will have my name on it, which will yes. indicate that I am not, uh, you know, a white yeah. person. Be Craig, Craig Smith. That's right. And I mean, every immigrant, uh, like everyone in my first generation family has kids. They they all have names like mine and they all have kids like my three kids, John, James and Elizabeth, in order to mm. avoid that problem. So, you know, wow. when you say you don't right. see color, uh, I I beg to differer. <laughs> you do. I went, by, I went by Olivia, which is my middle name. I tried at least in my early professional career. And then my dad heard me and the man burst into tears. And if you see the old Jamaican daddy, I'm a first generation American, y'all. So you see your old, older Jamaican gentleman who you've never seen cry in your whole life, burst into wow. tears because the name that he gave you that was special to you, you have decided to erase it yeah. so that people can see you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. My sure. Starbucks name is George. It's my middle name. I feel you. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I yeah. hijacked that question. But I, I think that's a really interesting thing that gets said to me a lot. Yeah. I don't see color. Yeah, you do give them a look like really, wow. Good for you. <laughs> Must be awesome. Oh, good. Um, let's see. Um... Melinda, did we answer that question? Or I mean, I no, feel like... I I, I I think that, like, I'm sorry. I was just, like, frustrated with the, the I don't see color part. I, 
I think that what's important is that um, the the element of uh, ethnicity is indelible. It is not it is not something that I can shed when I walk into a room or when I send an email or when I send out a piece of mail. So it is part and parcel of who I am. And it is something that can't be ignored and can't be hidden. Um, so yeah. I, I think there's an, there's an essential element, whereas there's a wide variety of other things like disability that there are invisible disabilities that, that many people have um, that you wouldn't necessarily know about. And um, ethnicity is one of those things that is a, a first element. If yeah. that makes sense. And diversifying your organization, I mean, we talked about it before, um, don't be lazy, but I guess if you are a lower level person, I, I think you just, you really just need to have your voice heard. I mean, you just need to, to figure out who hard. are your allies. It's hard. That is it. Yeah. Like, who, is there a person or persons in your organization with enough positional power mm -hmm or situational power, because you know, there's always that one. They may not have the VP title, but they know all the VPs and they know all the bodies of Barry. And yep. so is there someone who can whisper a word on your behalf? Have you been able to curry favor in order to be able to um, build those types of relationships? And then is it worth it? And so we get to decide, is it actually worth it? And so one of the things that's really clear to me is you better love your job as a fundraiser because the mission is great and fabulous and stuff. But if you don't love your work, if anything mm -hmm. in that organizational dynamic changes, the mission is not going to be enough to carry you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're in an abusive relationship. And so mm -hmm. that, that's a different conversation and a whole different webinar with other experts that we need to bring on board. But the yeah, point is... I want to I wanna listen to, to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're able to bring together, to able to align yourself with someone who has positional or situational power mm -hmm. that will allow for those moves to start to happen on your behalf, that is the way to do that with the lowest lift, but the highest value. Anything else is really putting yourself in harm's way. And I would not encourage anyone in 2020 to put yourself in harm's way for things that are systemic in the organization, particularly if you're not in a position of power enough in order to be able to change those things. Yeah. I'm going to end this session with this question. I think it's a good wrap up. With this work, progress is going to be real slow. It was all in caps, or at least slower than we would like. How can we recognize progress, no matter how small, so that we can recognize it and make sure that momentum doesn't stall or even slow down further? Mm. That's there's a million a, question. There's a Jewish rabbi that I quote at the end of a lot of my talks. Um, yeah. and, uh, he's from the sixth century and he says, never be afraid of work that has no end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like that's all of our work, whether it's the actual work of your nonprofit or your work as a human being, um, on yourself. And, and that is that your, your personal growth and your, um, your work to improve your community and the people to stand up for the people around you is all work that will have no end. It is something that we will never completely accomplish. And uh, so what I would say to this person is be encouraged that any effort on your part to make any injustice smaller or to make any movement towards justice, whether it's in your, own, in your organization or in your community or um, you know, in your life, whatever that looks like, that that is what I feel like we are all called to do. Uh, we're put on the planet to move things in a better direction, and it sounds like you're going to do that. Don't just don't be discouraged when things don't happen uh, as quickly as we would want it to. Um, it there's nothing really in life that's going to happen uh, as quickly or as effectively yeah. as we'd want it to. So we just have to keep moving in the direction of justice. Ain't that the truth? Mm -hmm. well, I wouldn't add to that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that was beautiful. I'm like, I don't, I got nothing. So thank you everyone for joining us today so much. I hope you found this discussion just as enlightening and encouraging as I did. As I said earlier, we are recording this webinar, so you will receive the full discussion tomorrow when we email it out, as well as some additional resources. 
In the meantime, please be sure to follow our panelists on social media. I have listed their Twitter, Twitter handle. Twitter. For <laughs> Um, so if we didn't answer your question, please don't despair. Uh, the resources we send out tomorrow should help you with what you are, um, what you're going through. And I encourage you to reach out to us on social media, ask us questions. Um, I know I can speak for QGIVE and say that we'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Um, I just wanna thank you and thank you to our panelists for being here. I Thank will you. go ahead and end things now, and hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good it was such a good deal. Keep the conversation going. Amen. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.